Hello folks, I'm Craig Shelton. This is UTN and you are watching The Cut. Let's do it. Welcome to The Cut. I'm Craig Shelton of UTN. This is Angelo Lawford. Angelo, how are you tonight? Not too bad, thank you. This is Richard Walker of HMW also. Richard, how are you tonight? Doing well. Folks, we talk sports on this show, and we talk sports on this show with you, the UTN Observer. We like to talk to you folks on Facebook. We like to talk to you folks on Twitter. We like to post questions and comments, and we ask you to participate, and we will definitely share your comments right here on the show. You can follow me on Twitter at Craig Shelton HMW. You can follow me on Facebook at Craig HMW Shelton. And guys, let's go ahead and get started. Right out the gate tonight, folks, we got some great topics tonight, and I think you're going to enjoy these. None other than the drama between the Lakers, Kobe Bryant, and Dwight the Nightmare Howard. I mean, how the hell we get here with Kobe being Bryant, or should I say Kobe the Black Mamba Bryant, versus Dwight Nightmare Howard. Dwight became a nightmare last year as he made his exodus uh, from Orlando Magic and just all of the circus stuff that went on with that. Folks, I'm not here to kill Dwight Howard. I'm not here to judge Dwight Howard. I think it's pretty clearly that he's a, a different type of personality uh, than what we're used to seeing in a Laker uniform, particularly a guy in a who's going to be the best player on the floor. Magic Johnson was a dominating personality. Mm -hmm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, led by example, was no pushover. As you know, in those Bruce Lee movies, he would kick you to death. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kobe Bryant has taken up the torch in L.A. and made L.A. Well, he didn't make it, but he just kept the franchise uh, history and what, what you come to expect from Laker basketball uh, prevalent. Now, enter Dwight Howard. Here's a guy who's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. He doesn't appear to be meshing with the personality of Kobe Bryant. And what we're going to try to figure out among us three right now is, is this about Kobe or is this about Dwight Howard? Uh, earlier um, in the week, Kobe Bryant uh, made statements that, you know, Dwight Howard, you know, with his nursing and injured shoulder, needs to step up, you know, he needs, and I'm paraphrasing his comments, but he basically called Howard out, his toughness out, and said, hey, look, you got to play hurt. Well, Howard has kind of been leaning towards more patience. Uh, Howard had a comment where he alluded to the fact that it took Kobe and Shaq three years to win the championship together. Mm -hmm. Kobe rebutted that by saying, we don't have three, four years. Right. Kobe's 34. Steve Nash is forever. <laughs> There's no number for Steve Nash's age. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know Steve Nash is old because he went and cut his hair, clearly indicating that he's having a midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. There's some urgency with the Lakers. They need to get this thing done. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is this. Is this a situation with Kobe Bryant where Kobe Bryant, when, when the Lakers are winning, it's all about Kobe. But when the Lakers are losing, is it a situation where it's somebody else's problem? Angelo. Well, I think, first of all, the comments from Kobe, I think, are predicated off the, the Paul Gasol injury. So I think that Kobe, is, he is, he's just desperate right now, and, and but but I what I didn't like what he did, or in what he did is that you can't really challenge somebody and and uh, for their injury because you don't know somebody's pain threshold. Mm -hmm. you, you you don't you don't have the the, the tools uh, available to measure that. 
So, so I, I, I didn't like that. Uh, you know, you didn't like the fact that he did it publicly, or you just didn't. You don't think that publicly, publicly. It's the, it's the, publicly. It's the fact that he did it publicly. Yeah, because I don't necessarily disagree. But, but, but I, I, I think now about Dwight Howard, I think he, he, he's confused. I don't know if he. He, he's caught in this in this like he's, he's a basketball player. What is he confused about? He's a basketball. He player. He just he just doesn't know what kind of basketball player he wants to be, what kind of man he wants to be. It seems he one day he's soft, one day he's hard. It, it, it just depends, you know. I, I I think he's just confused, and I and I and I think because I remember when he came into the league, he came in as this sort of a youthful uh, person that that had and this. He was waving the Christian. Yeah, 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 exactly, mm-hmm. exactly, yeah. and 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 I think that he. He realizes that he's actually like become a contradiction in a way, and I think that he doesn't know how to handle it. Richard, um, we just got through watching the entire country celebrate a guy who was once accused of murder, mm-hmm. uh, who played 17 years in the NFL and is about and, and, and retired after winning a Super Bowl, and we praise that guy for being a great leader. Isn't Kobe Bryant just being a great leader? If Ray Lewis did the exact same thing, would we not be praising what he did? I think absolutely we would. But here's the difference between Ray Lewis and Kobe Bryant. You never saw Ray Lewis challenge any of his teammates directly in public. He always did it anecdotally. We need to step up. We need to do this. We need to play better. We need to be more aggressive. We need to be tougher. He never pointed out individual um people on the team mm-hmm. and specifically about what they should have, should be doing. So I think the Lakers have a twofold problem. I think that um, Kobe, while he's right, he's definitely right about everything he said. Cause I don't even think Dwight Howard's hurt, but that should be handled man to man, face to face behind closed doors with the team. Dwight Howard on the other hand has been a, a circus act ever since he got into the league. Well, no and about I that. actually think he's got the wrong persona. Instead of being Superman, he should have been Clark Kent because he's basically a nerd with, with glasses that plays basketball. So the, the simple answer is Kobe needs to stop being public. Dwight Howard needs to stop being pubic. But here's the, here's the problem that the Lakers have. The problem that the Lakers have is that we're a few days from the All-Star game and the Lakers are not in one of the top eight seeds in the Western Conference. And not just that they're not one of the top seeds in the Western they're Conference, in the because at the beginning of the season... With this unit being put together, and we kind of got a preview of this type of of this type of project when the Lakers had Carl Malone, Gary Payton. Um, so we knew that this could take a while. We knew that this we know that this is a, a a group of guys that are aging. So we knew that there could be injuries. We knew Dwight Howard wasn't healthy coming into the league. So I mean, coming into the season. So we knew that it, there was a possibility that this thing could take a while, that maybe by the All-Star break, it it wasn't pretty yet. But I don't think at this point in the season, the caveat of a Kobe versus Dwight Howard being the opening segment of our show tonight, I don't think that was on Mr. Buss's uh, uh, plan. Let me me talk to you a little bit about, uh, I should say, share with you, I was talking to a um, former uh, Packer. Uh, he's in the Packer Hall of Fame, Greg Cook. Uh, works with uh, Sports, uh, Sports Talk 790 in Houston, the Fox affiliate. And we went on and on back and forth on Twitter a little bit about this. And one comment he said to me was, because I brought up the Ray Lewis angle that I brought to you guys. He said, but I don't think Ray Lewis would call out Ed Reed in the media. Mm-hmm. But Ray Lewis would never have to call out Ed Reed in the media. But see, Dwight Howard is not Ed Reed, Angelo. No, 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 and, and, and I agree with that. But, but still, to the point of, back, or back to your point, is it when they win, it's all about Kobe, and when they struggle, it's on everybody else. I, I, I think now that's part of the the problem. Kobe doesn't know how to handle defeat. He doesn't know how to handle um, opposition, so to speak. And then w- with the talent that Dwight Howard possesses. You have another alpha dog versus another alpha dog. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, it's like Shaq part two, in a way. Because if you remember the last days of Shaq in L.A., it was injury riddled, injury plague. So I, so I think he's seen the, the, the same thing unfold, and I, and I just don't think he knows how to handle it personally. Let me change the subject a little bit real quick. We're getting close to the end of the segment. Um, you know, I can remember being a Houston Oilers fan. You know, growing up in Houston, Texas, following the Oilers. 
And I remember back in 1997 when the team left the city. Mm. And when the team left the city, the team took the name, the team took the brand, the team took the colors, and they took it all to Tennessee. Yeah. And, and, and to this day, Houston Texan fans and Tennessee Titan fans don't have a good relationship. Nope. We're probably never going to have a, a good relationship. And I, I bring this up, in, and I know I'm talking NFL, but and I know we're in an NBA theme, but I bring it up because the Sacramento Kings uh, and that group uh, headed by Chris Henson, Henson that's going to purchase the team with his group from the Maloof brothers, well, they're going to purchase a more minority interest in the in the team, and they're going to move the team back to Seattle, and Seattle gets the name back. They get the Seattle Supersonics back. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about that, and I started to think about the Oilers and how, how horrible it felt not to just lose the team, but we all know that the Houston Texans should be wearing that Derrick Blue mm -hmm. and not that Steel Blue. The Derrick Blue should be something we see a couple times a year for a change of pace. Um, you know, should professional leagues legislate that when franchises move to a new city, that they have to start a new franchise with a new name, a new color scheme, a new brand in totality, and even if that city they're leaving never gets another team, then that, that then that's that's history. It's archived. It's not to be shared with another city. No one should be the allers. No one. Dallas shouldn't move to Green Bay and become the, the uh, Green Bay Cowboys. It shouldn't happen. Richard, I'll let you close us on that one. Well, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. And um, if you have any type of appreciation for history uh, with regards to a franchise, you don't want to see that move. I mean, one of the things that made me personally sick to my stomach, even though I'm not a fan, I'm still a Houstonian and it still strikes a chord to me. I went to a game in Nashville, Tennessee last year, and I see War Moons. Jersey in there. I see uh, uh, Eddie George, and I see uh, even though he, he started, he did start off as a Houston Oilers. I see his rookie jersey in there. I see uh, uh, Earl Campbell's number in the Raptors, and that's wrong as hell. They never played in Nashville. They never were affiliated with that city. Nashville fans should be ashamed. They should be embarrassed to put that up there. So I think that the history should stay with the city. And to that point, uh, the, the the sports bodies were. Uh, respectively should, should regulate that to make sure that they preserve that, that piece of history. No doubt about it. Thank you, guys. Well, folks, we're going to go ahead and go to our social media correspondent. We have Al Freeman sitting in for Alicia Stewart tonight. Alicia's under the weather. We wish her the best in her recovery. And we put it out on Facebook. We put it out on Twitter. And the question is, when the Lakers are doing good, is it all about Kobe? And when the Lakers are doing bad, is it all about everyone else? Let's go to Al Freeman and see what they had to say on Facebook and Twitter. In the sports world, this is Al D. Freeman. I'm filling in for the very lovely Alicia Stewart. Get better, Alicia. Get right to it. On Facebook, Kobe Bryant versus Dwight Howard. Uh, this is going to be good. Renwick Davis says, Kobe is all about Kobe, but he's right about Dwight Howard. Steve Nash and Kobe Bryant do not have three or four more years to get it. Good point. Uh, Nicholas Stevens says, here's what's wrong with Kobe. Dwight Howard is 28. He still has time. But once again, it's all about Kobe. Wow, Kobe's taking a hit here. League Brisby. Thank you, Mr. Brisby. You say, Kobe is an airhead. <laughs> Dwight Howard is in a situation where Kobe thinks he's God. And you fill in the blank. <laughs> That's fantastic. We're going to go straight in to Twitter. Love Twitter account. Oh, man. My man. My man, Greg Cook. Greg. Sports Talk 790. Great, great show, man. Says Dwight Howard needs to bring his game up to Kobe's. Wow. But he's also injured, so it may not be possible right now. Kobe needs to quit bringing the thing public. Good point. Good point. Uh, sports media, of course, one of the great writers here says, I like Kobe, but I can truly why some people look at him the way they do. Yeah, that's right. And True Dre, True Dre, thanks for sending it in, man, says, Dwight Howard, you need to man up. Man up, Dwight. Sal Freeman, fill it in for the great Alicia Stewart. This is social media. I'm throwing it back to Craig. 
Welcome back to the show, folks. I'm Craig Shelton. This is The Cut. You're in the right place. Angela Lawford from HMW, Richard Walker from HMW joining me on the set tonight. Uh, folks, remember, we like to talk with you about sports on Facebook, on Twitter. That's at Craig Shelton, HMW on Facebook, at HMW, I'm sorry, at Craig HMW Shelton on Facebook is how you can follow me there. Um, wow. This particular... Uh, topic here guys is why I wanted to do this show. I just think social media sometimes as much as it's been a blessing can be a curse and uh, the sports world and the entertainment world is so very active on Facebook and Twitter and unlike politicians they don't have a lot that they have to be responsible to in regard to what they say mm -hmm. what they do and we see athletes almost on a daily basis get themselves in a situation so we'll go there with this one folks uh, I got this story, on it. it's pretty much all over the place, but I went to Deadspin to get their take on it. Uh, Deadspin.com, Chris Ricks, former Florida State Seminole quarterback and current uh, college football insider for Fox Sports, went on Jay Moore's radio show uh, last Thursday and gay-baited former teammate Darnell Dockett, who uh, currently plays with the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Ricks co commented that... Um, there was always jokes about Darnell and what his preference was in college. Um, Moore then asked, uh, well, did they make fun of him in his face? To, to which Ricks replied, yes, they did. Um, he will get defensive at times, as most guys would, uh, because there were a few incidents of him hanging out in some dude's uh, room in the union and other stuff. Uh, Darnell Dockett did not take kindly to this at all, folks. Uh, he got very emotional about it in his reply. He went to Twitter and he went off on a rant on Twitter. He later, later deleted uh, those comments from his account, but by that time the damage was done. Screenshots were in the place to be, archived all over the country. Uh, I googled and the very first thing that popped up was the Deadspin article on it, and it and it had some of the comments. I'll read you some of Donnell Dockett's comments, and mind you, they are no, they're not for those with sensitive ears. Ears, so I'll, uh, I'll 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 filter my conversation here. Donnell Dockett tweeted, "I swear on my dead mother at Coach Ricks. That's a uh, Ricks handle on Twitter. When I see you, that's your ass," he says. Period. Expletive, expletive, lying on me. Bobby Bowden didn't even like your ass. Yeah. Um, he also tweeted at Coach, at Coach Ricks. Expletive, you expletive. <laughs> I heard you lying on me. No one liked your sorry ass ever. When I see you, I'm whooping your ass on everything mm -hmm. I love. Uh, for those of you that did not grow up in the hood, when a black person tells you on everything I love, that's pretty that's pissed real. off. Yeah. Pretty pissed off. Uh, Donnell Dockett went on to tweet at Coach Ricks, and expletive your apology, you expletive. Say everything you said on radio in my face. Clearly, my man Donnell Dockett has that's a true. little problem with anyone alluding to him being gay. Now there's some more comments here and I'll share those with you but I want to go to Angelo and to Richard just based on what you've heard to this point because there was an apology issued by Ricks and there was an apology and then there was also a comment tweeted by Ricks in response to Dockett's not, re not receiving or not accepting his apology. Okay, So I'll read those to you but based on what you've heard so far What's going on with social media? It, are we looking at a situation to where NFL teams, NBA teams, MLB teams, um, soccer franchises and organizations, are they going to actually start having to legislate into their contracts, into the league contracts? Is this something that's going to have to be collectively bargained to get some type of common ground? Because if players do damage to their own reputation, it's one thing. But if you're a player that are the face of the franchise and this happens to you, 
now you're digging into the pockets of the team because you're so closely associated with sponsor relationships. Angelo, I'll let you come in. Well, uh, what immediately comes to mind for me is I remember Richard Mendenhall had some sort of a 9-11 tweet uh, fest or Facebook, one of the two, man, and that was that wasn't good. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I think it's a travesty that Darnell Dockett has to defend himself from this madness. Just doesn't seem right. And and, and I understand that there was an apology uh, sent his way, mm -hmm. but but it, it, in the spirit of it, it, it doesn't suffice, in, in my opinion. But 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 with that said, uh, when it comes to social media, I, I I think you know what's funny about life. You have to adapt to the times. You have to adapt to, to different things that, 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 that are invented, created. So, I mean, maybe five years ago you wouldn't have thought about something being collectively bargained about social media. But now with the, with the ascension of Twitter and Facebook, I mean, now you have to just look at... It's, it's more no, mess. I think we hit it that way. It, it's more mess for people to have to deal with. Yeah. It, it franchises. It, it's, 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 it's a headache. Not, so. to, not to mention the embarrassment that, that you the potential risk you put your family at mm -hmm. uh, being embarrassed. Uh, Richard, uh, this all started with uh, Donnell Dockett. Now, Dockett is not exonerated from criticism in this, mm -hmm. not just because of his comments. This all started um, when when A.J. McCarron, the uh, national championship uh, quarterback from Alabama, um, there was a lot of media hype around his beautiful, lovely girlfriend. And she is a gorgeous young lady. She really is. Well, Dockett went on Twitter and flirted with her on Twitter. And so when that was brought up by Jay Moore in the interview with Chris Ricks, that's when Ricks made the comment. I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing again. Well, I'm kind of surprised to hear that Darnell likes girls. And Jay Moore wasn't going to let that slide. He jumps all over that. You know what I mean? Uh, there is some audio available that you folks can go out and Google it up. And uh, there's audio on this. Um, but as we move forward, let me go ahead and give you the comments uh, that came from Chris Riggs to Darnell Dockett. Um, and he tweeted at D Dockett. That's Darnell Dockett's Twitter handle. Apologize about the radio show yesterday, Doc. Combo was about you, K Webb, and G Jones. I let it go somewhere. It should not have gone. My bad, DD. Well, <laughs> I've already read you the, the, the response uh, from Darnell Dockett, basically, expletive, 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 telling him where you could go with, with, his, uh, with his apology. And to which Ricks then tweeted, uh, one thing you can control about apologizing to someone, do it. One thing you can't control is whether they accept it. And when I think about this, I think about the fact that I, you know, I, I saw, and I don't know if I would be willing to accept this apology either. Really? I don't know that I go on a Twitter rant about it. I'm pretty, pretty secure within my manhood. I know who I am. So if someone was to just to run a rumor out about me relative to me being a homosexual, I wouldn't like it. You know, I have a wife, I have kids, I have family. I wouldn't like, because there's always some percentage of people that when your name is slandered, that we just live in a, in a society that's, that it's easier for this society to accept the negative than, than reach that for the positive. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think that I would go on a Twitter rant about it. Now, people, I'm known for going on Twitter rants. But I think, I think to even acknowledge certain things it doesn't mean that you have something to hide, but to me, something like that isn't even, it doesn't even want a response from me. And if it does get a response from me, it doesn't get one on that level. I think about Houston Texans running back Arian Foster. You know, he was going at it on Twitter with uh, the Iron Sheik, mm -hmm. a guy that's known for sarcastic tweets, <clears throat> excuse me, a guy that does this to get a reaction out of folks. And I think that Houston Texans running back Aaron Foster, who has a reputation on Twitter himself, but not for that type of behavior, um, I don't think he even understood what was going on. You know, so he, he took it out of context, and I believe some other Texans, from what I hear, may have stepped up. I think the Texans defensive ta uh, offensive tackle, Pro Bowl, Dwayne Brown, may have stepped in 
and um, advise Foster of what the situation was and how this character go character goes about things on Twitter. Uh, but anyway, guys, good conversation. I appreciate it, Angelo. Appreciate it, Richard. Good segment. Um, we will not have a social media segment on this one, folks. Uh, Thrown to our correspondent because. This was all about social media. You got it right here. So what we'll do is we will get ready to uh, run to the soccer report, and then we'll go to a break. And after that, we'll be right back here on the cut to talk about the $100 million man, Mr. Joe I'm Craig Shelton for UTN, sitting here with Angelo Lawford, and this is the soccer report. Uh, Angelo, the CONCACAF hexagonal phase of the World Cup qualifying is now underway. The United States men's national team lost to Honduras in their first game within the Hex. Uh, what did you take away, Angela, from the uh, Angelo? I'm sorry, from the United States overall performance, and in regard to what happened in the group overall, what did you think? All right. Well, uh, you have to understand historically, it's hard to play in a place like Honduras. So um, I'm not surprised at the result, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, understanding the fact that the United States men's national team is caught in two minds, the old way, the traditional way, versus this new, more aesthetically pleasing way. Right. So, it's, so it's really difficult to really get a gauge because I don't think they are where they need to be quite yet. So um, with that said, it was, a, it was a hostile environment to go to, to Honduras the way that they did. And uh, so I, I'm not surprised by the result, mm -hmm. and, and I hope that the United States will, will, will get their bearings and, and be able to become the team that they hope to be well, have, so, moving forward. Has your opinion changed about the group? Well, no, I still believe that the United States will qualify. I, I, I think it's going to be them, Mexico, Jamaica, and Honduras. And they played each other conversely, so, so you know, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting. You, you, uh, Mexico and Jamaica drew 0-0. Zero, zero, which is a good result for Jamaica because right. they played in, in Mexico. So, so that was a, a heck of a result for them. And, uh, you know, within the group, the United States are the only team without a point because uh, they lost to Honduras, then Panama and Costa Rica also played to a draw. So in a draw, you get one point, you know, per team. Right. So, so we'll see what happens going forward. But, but I still am hopeful. I still believe that the United States will qualify, and I think it's going to be the United States, Jamaica, Honduras, and Mexico. I just don't know in what order. Thank you, Angelo. Good job there as usual. Folks, I'm Craig Shelton. That's Angelo Lawford, our cor uh, soccer correspondent right here on UTN. This is The Cut, and we'll talk to you later. To the show, it is The Cut, segment number three. Angelo Lawford from HMW, Richard Walker from HMW in studio. Been having a good time tonight talking about some pretty, pretty intense uh, topics, and we'll keep rolling with one here. Uh, folks, remember you can get at us on Facebook at Craig HMW Shelton and on Twitter at Craig Shelton HMW. Joe Flacco, guys, the $100 million man, is he or isn't he? To be or not to be? Do we pay Joe Flacco $100 million? Folks, we put out on Twitter, uh, uh, put it out on Twitter and Facebook about this, and then we did get comments and we'll share them with you later in the social media part of this segment. Um, uh, but with Joe Flacco about to cash in on the Super Bowl victory, guys, uh, I, I hate to ask if the NFL, and I'll call it the pricing game, are they close to legislating themselves into a real bad situation? When I think of Joe Flacco and what I've watched over the last five years, six years or whatever it be, um, I see a physical specimen with a big arm, a uh, pretty gutsy guy, he'll stand in the pocket, you know, smart guy. Uh, he's had accuracy, accuracy uh, issues in more shorter intermediate routes and underneath stuff. Uh, he'll miss some real easy throws sometimes uh, in short windows. But obviously he's got that big arm to stretch the field and he can stretch it uh, to the furthest corner of the field. I mean, the guy has what it takes. That's been well documented with what he's done in the playoffs that who will forget that 70-yard pass to Jacoby Jones, which mm -hmm. much of it was in the air, uh, throwing back against his body across the field that way. But I just think that the NFL, the fact that the NFL is has allowed itself to get in situations to where teams are drafting players, going through the scouting process, drafting these guys, taking the risk, developing these talents first four to six years, and then teams can barely afford to keep the guys that they made the risk on, they made the investment in, mm -hmm. the NFL has a system where it rewards futility. 
if you are the team with the worst record in the league, you get the draft first. If you're the team that's doing things right, like the Patriots, like the Ravens, and the 49ers, look what's, what's what's gonna happen to the 49ers over, over the next couple of years where that roster's built with so much young talent. The, the NFL has a welfare system where they reward those who don't achieve, and they subsequently they penalize folks who are getting it right. Because you can't keep the people you, you're invested in. I just have a fundamental issue with that, Richard. Well, I think you, you, made, you brought an interesting point. And to some degree, I think that's part of the reason why they really need to look at the way that these contracts are structured. Uh, I'm glad, I am glad that they did address the rookie, the rookie contract issue because you had all these overhyped sensations that came in, a la Jamarcus Russell, to come in and make big bucks up front, and they never pan out. On the back end, you kind of have the second half of that that needs to be addressed. So you got a guy like Flacco with the big arm. Yes, he wins the Super Bowl. Was he a key? He played great. He played great, but was he a key? Was he? He was a key factor, but was he the guy who took you to the mountaintop? Mm, That's somewhat debatable. Uh, I think someone you know more like a Drew Brees, who clearly is the heart and soul of that franchise and that city. That's a hundred million dollar guy. Joe Flacco, on the other hand, is a good quarterback, not a great. Uh, franchise uh, changing quarterback. I think you could make the argument that there is some comparable talent out there to him that you could very easily replace on easily, that team, easily make that, and argument. still make a, you know have similar results. So, on, on the other hand, however, you have to think about what the market dictates, and this is the way that these contracts are structured. That's why I said they need to take a look at it. I think that the entire uh, NFL contract system should be incentive based. Obviously, with you know some type of uh, way to reward those that do achieve through uh, continuance of their performance, because uh, one of the things about the league is that it is a "what have you done for me lately" kind of league. Let me go here with this. Uh, you say that a guy like a Drew Brees, mm-hmm. who is clearly the heart and soul of this team, uh, at Pauly G Radio, uh, Sports Talk Radio host with Sports Radio Six Ten, uh, the CBS Radio. That's the home of the Houston Texans. Um, here's what Paul has tweeted, and I think this is an interesting tweet. How many guys, period, should really make $100 million? Resigning him may be letting Reed, Bolden, or McKinney walk. That would hurt badly. Right. See, you can say Aaron, uh, you can say Aaron Rodgers, you can say Drew Brees, Peyton Manning. I just don't know that. I don't know. I don't know that it's healthy for the team. Finance. If the, I'm sorry, the league. Financially, and I, I'm almost certain it's not healthy for the league from a philosophical standpoint because what you're doing is you're limiting what you can do with your with the rest of your roster for one thing. Um, these contracts are back loaded, and a lot of times they don't see that money anyway, and that creates an element that I really don't appreciate. I heard uh, former uh, Philadelphia Eagle Andy Kalu who works on the Fox affiliate in Houston talking about on his radio show, he's never had anyone call him when a team cuts a player and argue that the team should honor the last two years of that contract, Mm -hmm. whereas the minute a player holds out, everyone is all over the players. There, there, There are so many things when you start looking at how many arteries there is to the NFL salary structure, and I know it's the best league, and I know they have the most success, and I'm a huge fan, and I'm going to watch every week. But I just think the direction that the league is going, you can't tell me that it makes any fundamental sense on any level for teams to be vested in players financially and on every level with coaching and, and, and all of the support and not be able to keep the player on their roster. The NFL roster shouldn't have continuity. They should have the ability to maintain continuity on their rosters. I think the league's brand is stronger if we could do what we used to do and associate names with teams. Terry Bradshaw was a Pittsburgh Steeler. Jack Lambert was a Pittsburgh Steeler. You know what I mean? Uh, Danny, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm about to say Danny White, but Roger Staubach. Cowboy. Was a Dennis Cowboy, Joe Montana. We, you know, even though he did go to the Chiefs for a couple, of years, a couple of years or so there at the end of his career, 
You know what I mean? He mm -hmm. was a chief. Earl Campbell was thought of, I mean, 49er. Mm -hmm. Earl Campbell was thought of as a Houston Oiler. I just don't think that this works. Uh, let me run back to the social media with this. Uh, Lance Zerline, who also works at the Fox affiliate in Houston, he says, I'm thinking Flacco's payday is going to have a huge ripple effect on the top quarterbacks around the NFL. I think teams are just waiting it out until the salary cap jumps to $30 million in a couple of years. Angela. Well, it's kind of like I hear the name Drew Brees, and yeah, some would say that he deserves uh, $100 million or whatever, just in a in crazy contract. But but the thing is, like, I, I sit here and I, and I ask myself, well, what's the difference between Drew Brees and Joe Flacco? Like, like, like why does Drew Brees have this sort of um, uh, inflated perception when they're virtually equal? They both had one Super Bowl. You can say the same thing about uh, Peyton Manning. They had one Super Bowl. But isn't it the eye test? We know Peyton Manning is an exceptional quarterback. Mm -hmm. We know when we watch Drew Brees play the quarterback position, we see a much more efficient performance at the position. But at the end of the day, it's still a results-driven business, and the results are virtually the same. I, I, so I agree. So you say a Trent Dilfer should be a hundred million dollar man? You I'm not. Some, but, but 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 if no, like, but, but, Trent Dilfer actually works to, to his argument more so than if if, if, if if you're looking at if you look at Flacco, Flacco's come in the league and done nothing but win. And he might not win pretty. He might not win um, effortlessly, or like like a Tom Brady or a Peyton Manning can and has done over their career. But at the but at the end of the day, the results are still the same. So why not a hundred million dollars for Joe Flacco? If you replace Joe Flacco with any of those other quarterbacks, does it still work? Yes. If you I, replace Drew maybe, Brees maybe. with Joe Flacco, does it work? I don't, I, don't I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know because because Drew Brees, I'm sorry, Joe Flacco has the he has the added comfort zone of having that 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 big seven foot uh, shot blocking center mm -hmm. that saves you when you get beat on the baseline or saves you when you get crossed over in a guy like Ray Lewis and that leadership, which is not just about Ray, but that entire Baltimore Raven defense. Right. Mechanisms, because so many times when we saw Joe Flacco not play at an efficient level, it was always about that Ravens defense that kept mm -hmm. them in games and gave them an opportunity to win. It's, it's going to be interesting to see, folks, what's going to become of the Joe Flacco Baltimore Ravens, because that's who they are now, post Ray Lewis. Um, and I think, and you and I joked about this before we got on set tonight, I think that the Ravens are making a mistake if they pay this guy all this money. And for me, as radical as it may sound, because people don't think outside the box, we have to do what we do every year after the Super Bowl and, and ride the tide. But before I would put my team in jeopardy and making a bad deal that may hurt them for the next five years, and in the NFL, if you beat up for five years, you may be in trouble for eight. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's going on, even though you probably got the best GM in football and Ozzy Newsom, I'd be looking for other options with Joe Flacco not to exclude moving him. And I know that's Craig, you're asinine. He just won a Super Bowl. He's about 28 years old. How can you get rid of him? Because he's not worth $100 million. And if he gets stuck on that $100 million price range, and if that owner forces Ozzy Newsom to give him that money, because I have to think that Ozzie Newsom won't give He's a, a smart guy. He knows better than that. Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see. Appreciate it, guys. Very good comments on that. We'll run the social media. We'll go back to Al Freeman, who's sitting in tonight for Alicia Stewart. She's under the weather. And we'll see about what they have to say on Facebook and Twitter about Joe Flacco, the $100 million man. Welcome back, world. I'm Al D. Freeman. This is social media. I'm filling in for the very lovely Alicia Stewart. Hope you get better, Alicia. Let's get right to it on Twitter. Joe Falacco, the $100 million man ha, at Big Toro, says, I say yes. Flacco should make $100 million, especially with the NFL salary cap going from $120 mil to $170 mil. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh, at Gordon2012 says, Four years, eighty million with thirty-five million guaranteed at most. That's the most I'd pay him. Mm. Got deep pockets there, my man. And at Malik Thomas, 
If Shaw can steal 62 million minute Matt Shaw with the Houston Texans, then I guess it's okay for Flacco to steal at least 80. It's up for debate. We're going to go straight into Facebook on this. Joe Flacco, once again, being the $100 million man. Nick Bryan said, nah, they need to pay $100 million to keep Ray Lewis. He's a motivation. <clears throat> yeah, $1 million to see Ray dance. Pay Ray also to limp around another year or so, because I don't see Flacco doing the same thing without Ray. Good point. Natalie Holmes, oh, very lovely lady. Natalie says, he will be worth it if he gets the same production from the crop of players he's left with. Ah, they can't afford to keep the present team if he's going to break the bank. This dude has deep pockets. He can pay him $200 million. It wouldn't matter. Uh, Greg Surlis Jr. says, you know he's not getting $100 million, Craig, but considering his success, he's forced them to give him at least $60 million guaranteed. Al D. Freeman at Facebook says, all you teachers who said I needed to study and not consider sports as an option, 100 million. This has been Al Freeman on social media. Folks, welcome back to the show. It's the Cut with Craig Sheldon, Angelo Lawford, Richard Walker. We're going to get ready to run to a break. We want to say thank you to Al Freeman for filling in for Alicia Stewart, who's ill tonight with the social media. Great comments uh, from the folks on Facebook and Twitter. Folks, when we come back, we're going to keep it on the NFL theme, and uh, we're going to have a little fun with this one. We're going to talk about an uh, NFL draft pool idea I came up with. Hang in there, folks. We'll be right back. It's the cut. Back to the cut. We are on the final segment of what has really been a uh, really good a good show tonight, folks, in regard to topics. i um, real pleased with some of the feedback we've gotten on the social media from you folks on Facebook and Twitter. Remember, you can always follow me on Twitter at Craig Shelton HMW and on Facebook at Craig HMW Shelton. Angelo Lawford from HMW, Richard Walker from HMW. I want to give both you guys an opportunity to tell folks how to follow you on Facebook and how to uh, follow you on Twitter. Angelo. All right, well, Twitter is uh, simple at the law creeps or at the law underscore creeps. Uh, for Twitter, and then uh, just my name, Angelo Lawford, uh, for Facebook. Richard? I'll make it even simpler for you. HMW, at HMW Big Walker, and uh, the same goes for uh, Facebook, HMW Big Walker. Folks, I also want to encourage you folks to go check out the Houston Media Watch website. Both of these guys write for the site and do an excellent job, by the way. Angelo is our soccer cor correspondent, but he will mix it up on football and basketball. He's really, really excellent on basketball. Richard Walker. Besides him being a Cowboy fan, which clearly no one holds against him, uh, but he's uh, nobody does it like Richard, Richard Common Sense Walker. We encourage you folks to go to the HMW blog and check things out there at HoustonMediaWatch.com. HoustonMediaWatch.com, and uh, we appreciate you there. Uh, we, I told you uh, at the end of the last break, folks, that we're going to keep it on an NFL theme. And uh, obviously we were talking about Joe Flacco, uh, a.k.a. the $100 million man. I think pretty much Richard and I agree that I don't, we don't mm -hmm. think that he's worth $100 million. I really wasn't sure where you really feel with that. You were kind of riding the fence with me there. I mean, it, would you give him the money? You're the GM. Would you give him the money? I don't know if I would give him the money, but, but if you look at why you're giving people the money, whether you're giving it to them based on, uh, you know, expectation of, uh, versus what they've actually accomplished, the potential, then, then, but th at the end of the day, it's about results. So I, what are you paying for? Results or potential? And, 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 and that's where, like, that's why I'm not a GM. But, um... But would you give him the money? Would you give Joe Flacco $100 million? $100. It's simple. Would you give Joe Flacco... One hundred million dollars. My gut says no, but but I really can't say for certain. So sometimes you get, yeah. there's a there's a famous DJ from Houston, uh, Mean Green, he was a radio personality around Houston for real. And Mean Green used to always say, "I do what I want to do. Y'all do what y'all can do." Um. Jim Harbaugh did what he wanted to do when he set Alex Smith down mm -hmm. yeah. for 
Colin Kaepernick. And I think forward-thinking people will do what they need to do. And I think Ozzy Newsom, if given, if he's given complete autonomy, I just believe a man that has been so smart in building that Ravens franchise all these years is going to be very hesitant about giving Joe Flacco that type of money. Here's the best that I can do for Joe Flacco. Franchise Joe Frack, Flacco for, two, for 2013, 2014. The salary cap goes up for 2014, I believe it is, mm -hmm. and we'll real address it at that point. Because I, I want to see who Joe Flacco is. We talked about the achieving. I want to see who he is once we see what the Ravens are. Yeah. Because much of what Joe Flacco has been is, has been about what the Ravens were because of that fantastic, that awesome defense. I agree with That's that. what it's been about. Um, but thinking about all of this stuff with Joe Flacco, I, I kind of got my mind going with a couple different areas. One, I got it going with, um, I, I started thinking about power rankings going for the 2013-2014 season of NFL quarterbacks. And let's just face it, this was the year of the quarterback mm -hmm. with these fabulous, fabulous rookies coming into the league, adding to the, to the top-notch talent already in the league. Then I started to think about what if we could take the entire NFL player base, every player, put them in a draft pool, and for the 2013-2014 season, draft. And I started thinking about what I wanted to talk to you guys about with it is, who would you draft? Who would be your top five guys that you would draft if we put the entire league in the draft pool? You could be the head of whatever franchise, the Cowboys, your Houston Texans. Who would you pick? Who would be the five players that you would start your team with? Here's mine. At quarterback, I would take Aaron Rodgers. That would be my guy. Mm -hmm. I think he has a, the ability, obviously, to, he has an arm that's a, that's a tomahawk missile, accuracy, and he's mobile. He's the whole package. The Packers could run pistol sets every now and then to mix it up. Rodgers could do that. He's that type of athlete. Then I take J.J. Watt. Defensive Player of the Year. Then I take the best pure running back in football. Pure runner, Adrian Peterson. Number four, I got a couple people when I put this on Facebook and Twitter that was like, really? You take this guy over Megatron? Julio Jones for me. Julio Jones is electric. He's he lightning. Is. He's big. He has a unique ability to catch the ball. Be careful now. He has a unique, he's a touchdown maker. Kevin Johnson had five touchdowns this year with all those yards. Just keep that in mind. Julio Jones catches tough, tough passes in traffic, in extremely tight windows, and he has something that Calvin Johnson does not have, and there's no knock on Calvin, because not many have it. He beats you over the top consistently, all the time, no matter whether you're in cover three, it doesn't matter. He beats you over the top. He's that fast, and he's big. He's a special talent. You're going to take that and look back in a couple of years, Richard Walker. <laughs> Number five, and I know he's coming off a, a serious injury, but Darrell Revis. So my five are Aaron Rodgers, J.J. Watt, Adrian Peterson, Julio Jones, controversial pick, and Darrell Revis. Richard, I'll start with you. You're the one making all the faces. Okay, okay. Roll with it. Okay. Give me your five. Well, well, I'm going to go right after your one of your, your last comments. Okay. And that is my number one pick would be Megatron, Calvin Johnson. Um, I don't think that we've seen anything like Calvin Cal Cal Johnson in this league. I think, I think we have. Harold uh, Carmichael, Randy Moss. We've seen. No, I think Calvin Johnson is what Randy Moss should be. What, slow? Calvin Johnson is not slow. By comparison to Randy Moss, no. he's slow. No, no, no. I think okay. we probably need to go back to the combine numbers, but uh, I, don't, I wouldn't. Hmm? Hey, Calvin and I'm not knocking saying. Calvin Johnson, don't get me wrong. Um, there's a reason why he broke Jerry Rice's record. Yes, it is. Um, so, And there's a reason why he had five touchdowns as well. Well, the, the guy with the clipboard has a lot to do with that. So, um, My second pick would be Adrian Peterson. I mean, he is just an absolute beast. He is, if you were to take a, a piece of a, a, a machine and hand it a football, that's, that's Adrian, Adrian Peterson. Yep. He's this unstoppable. And with my fourth pick, I'm actually going to go with a defensive player. And it's not who you think. Uh, I'm going to go with Alden Smith. Alden Smith? Alden Smith. Over J.J. Um, over Watt. Over J.J. Watt. Over J.J. Watt. Over Marcus Ware. Whatever. Um, 
Jonas Smith is the definition of a pass rusher. This guy is, in my opinion, he's the most complete pass rusher in the league right now. But J.J. Watt is the best player in the league, and he had more sex than Under, the best understood. pass rusher, Alden Smith. Understood. Oh, okay. But he is a guy who is a nightmare for a quarterback. And in this passing league, you need someone who can put pressure on the quarterback and force them into mistakes. That's, that's why I pick him. All right, I disagree with okay. Uh, last but not least, rounding out my top five is um, actually going to go on the other side of the same team with your first pick. I'm going to go with Ronnie White because I think he has some of the best hands in uh, football. He does not draw passes very often. Oh, I buy Ronnie, Ronnie White. Yeah, good list, good list. Don't completely agree with you. Angelo. Well, I'm going to go with uh, after what I saw in the Super Bowl, I like the upside of Colin Kaepernick. I like his size, I like his strength, I like his speed. His arm is, is just a rocket. Okay. So so I, I, I like him going forward and, and, bo and being forward thinking. For a receiver, I'm going to have to go with Des Bryant. Uh, Good I, I, I think he is uh, He's an awesome a, football a, player. You know, just ascending to be a great player. Yep. And I agree with you for running back, Adrian Peterson. I don't think you can, there, 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 there's no, not even Best a close Best pure second. running back yes, in football. Excellent. Pure excellent running back. back. And then uh, defensively, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose two defensive players. I believe I'm gonna choose Darrell Revis like you did, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna follow suit and also choose the best defensive player in the world right now uh, when it comes to football and JJ Watt. Yeah, I don't I don't see how you didn't pick JJ Watt, but fun segment and I, I appreciate you guys and good job on the show tonight. Don't doubt. Folks, that's gonna wrap us up for this week. I want you folks to get out there and hustle hard and whatever you do. Hold on to everything you hustle for. We'll see you right here next week. And remember, ask yourself, can you make the cut?